Good morning, Hannah. Good morning. Good morning, Karen. Okay, we've got 8 o'clock. Why don't we get started? Good morning, Sex Stats. Welcome to 8 a.m. on October 1st. So we made it through September, and here we are. One week from today, we'll be having a quiz in here. Let's give it up for the quiz. People are all excited, mm -hmm. all right? Feel excited about that? And the day after that, we have an exam that will be due. So tomorrow, I'll hand out a prompt that will be the writing prompt for the exam that's due on Friday, October 9th. Okay, and we'll work our way back from there. So the day before that, we'll have our computer quiz. That'll be a Thursday. Good morning, Vanessa. The day before that, we'll have our last chance to check in and make sure that we're all okay for the computer quiz, our last chance to practice. Okay, that'll be that, that Wednesday. And then on Monday, we'll have a couple of things going on. We'll have a typical journal club. And for the journal club, we will, as always, have a TED Ed um, set of questions that you can answer for that. I'm delighted to report that there's a good chance, although I can't be sure, that Dr. Bickman will join us on Monday to listen. Uh, she's not going to teach in any way, but we are going to be talking about her journal article. We like to feature articles that are coming from Denison faculty and from Denison students, and she uh, was the author on this, and it was actually run on Denison students, so I think we'll have the opportunity to see some of the departmental research featured on Monday. Dr. Bickman will be there to listen, and hopefully people will uh, be very talkative during that, that session, and we'll have some conversation, too, about our um, causal modeling. You might remember that we introduced structural equation modeling and path analysis, and we talked about some of that yesterday. We had some of that in Gwen's presentation last time around. So after we have our first half hour with Dr. Bickman's article and our journal club back there, we'll come here and uh, Shelby will have her presentation. And the week after that, we've got Victoria on, on slate. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the beginning of next week. I'm working back in time. And then tomorrow we'll have a TED-Ed session. And there'll be uh, already some TED-Ed questions out there for you. And uh, I think you'll find those to be um, fairly interesting. Uh, they're going to be on the topic of effect size and power analysis. Okay, and which you may have done in research methods. Some of you might be a little bit rusty on that. Some of you might be pros on that. But we'll talk about effect size and power analysis. And today, what we're going to do is continue our conversation on regression. And we were finishing off yesterday by talking about regression. And we know that there's an intimate relationship between regression and correlation. Now what we're going to do is do some nonlinear regression, as we had started yesterday. So I wonder if you might join me out in Excel. And we'll continue our conversation from yesterday. We got pretty far <clears throat> into this, and out on the S drive, there's a bunch of practice sets. And within the practice sets, there's a, a folder that's labeled something like nonlinear regression. <clears throat> and then this is as far as we got yesterday. You're uh, creating simple 
pairs of scores. We had seven pairs of scores. <clears throat> and we used some random numbers that were generated between 1 and 50. And they were, we were fitting different kinds of models to them. And we were having Excel do this. And, and we'll spend a lot of time today looking at these nonlinear models okay, before we get uh, really, really deep into more complicated kinds of linear regression. We've done linear regression already. We're already familiar with y equals mx plus b. These are now more complicated <coughs> models that we have. And we can compare one to the next and see which one is making the best fit to the data. Right? Because regression is all about prediction, and we want to see how well we can predict this. So by a show of hands, how many people have that one up? It says linear and nonlinear regression. Is anybody missing that? Okay. Okay. So why don't we go ahead and continue on our, our quest to make uh, more and more nonlinear uh, regression charts, uh, as you see them here. So here's linear, here's nonlinear, and this is a power function, and you can see that there is the r squared. What does r squared tell us? The direction and the strength of the correlation is what R tells us. It's R squared tells us something just a little bit different than that, but R tells us the direction and the strength of the correlation. R squared, we lose the directional information, but it tells us something about the goodness of fit, if you will. Now, we use that phrase often when we're talking about chi-square, but still we're looking at the quality of the fit between that line, which might be straight, as we see in this case, or be curvilinear, as we see in that case, and we see what proportion of the variation in our scores can be attributed to that line or is coincident with that line. Okay? So interestingly enough, we can frequently use the R squared as a measure of effect size. And tomorrow, or for tomorrow's TED, we'll learn about another measure of effect size called Cohen's D. How many people have seen Cohen's D before? Okay? Uh, hopefully we, we all did that in research methods, but we'll get another look at it tomorrow. And that's one indicator of effect size. Another one is R squared. It tells us the proportion of variation explained in the the data set, and it goes from 0 to 1, okay, is uh, what we have for R squared, which we also call the coefficient of determination, okay? Okay, just as a little bit of review, does anybody remember that we contrasted the coefficient of determination, R squared, with the coefficient of <laughs> variation in one of our TED-Ed questions? Who remembers seeing that question? Coefficient of variation versus coefficient of determination? Okay. Anybody want to recall for us what the coefficient of variation is? People are not sure they remember what the coefficient of variation is. Okay. Coefficient of variation is a simple ratio. And we said on the first day of class we'd have ratios, ratios, ratios. So this ratio is the ratio of the standard deviation over the mean. Okay. And it gives us some indication of just how variable that set is. Standard deviation up top, mean on the bottom. We take a ratio of those two numbers, that's the coefficient of variation. When it's really, really low, we don't have that much variation. When it's higher, we have more variation. This is the coefficient of determination, the R squared. It tells us the proportion of variance explained. Right? And it's a measure of effect size, and it goes from 0 to 1. We contrast that with uh, another kind of effect size, which is Cohen's D. Okay, why don't we do a few more of these? So just to remind you of what was going on over here, uh, we had this number, 0.5625. And what that was, this was the critical R value. In fact, I'll label it as such. Okay, I'll call this critical R. Actually, it's critical R squared. And just to remind you where that came from, we had seven pairs of scores. Okay? So we are going to have now five degrees of freedom. Can somebody remind us why that's the case? We have seven pairs of scores in a correlational analysis or in linear regression analysis. Why would the degrees of freedom be five? are not sure why the degrees of freedom are five. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, for uh, saying so. The generic formula for degrees of freedom is the number of observations that you have minus some other number. And that other number is the number of parameters that you're estimating. And in certain cases, uh, if we're taking, for example, a list of numbers and we're finding the mean, we're estimating the mean, right? We're estimating the central tendency, right? So that would be one parameter that we're estimating. If we're doing a correlation, we're actually taking a mean or an estimate of the central tendency of the x scores, 
and also a mean or an estimate of central tendency for the y scores. We're estimating two parameters. So it would be the number of pairs of scores, the number of observations that we have, minus the number of parameters estimated. So it's n minus 2 in this case because we have two parameters. Equivalently, you can think about this for linear regression. We have y equals mx plus b. We're going to estimate an m. We're going to estimate a b, a slope in an intercept. So again, we have two parameters that we're estimating. So it's the number of observations. In this case, we're using seven pairs minus the two parameters that we're estimating. And so we wind up with five degrees of freedom. Who's following that? That work for us? Okay. And then we can look on a chart and we can see what would be the critical R value that you'd need to get to or exceed in order to say that you have a significant correlation or you have a significant regression. And that turned out to be, I don't know if you can see it in there, 0.75 for the R. And for R squared, it's 0.75 squared or 0.5625. So if you have this in front of you, and you are hitting the F9 key, and I encourage you to do that. So you're coming up with brand new random numbers each time. Every once in a while, you come to an R squared that is going to be as large as or larger than 0.5625. And when that happens, you have a significant effect. You have a, a significant correlation, I should say. Okay. Who's following that? Yeah? Okay. In fact, why don't we do it this way? That's our critical R squared value. Um, and so that is critical R squared, and that formula was equal to 0.75 squared. And 0.75, again, was the, uh, the critical R. Okay. So why don't we have Excel do a check for us to see if we have a significant correlation or not. And this will give us another chance for next Thursday's computer quiz to review on the if statement. So let's do it this way. We'll have Excel report to us whenever we have a linear correlation that is exceeding uh, the, the critical value there. So we'll say equals if, okay, <clears throat> and now we can look at this one. If that value, that R squared value, so that's my neighbor upstairs. Maybe I can make this a little bit bigger for now anyway. Oops, I can't do that in the middle of the question. If my neighbor upstairs is greater than 0.5625, then I can say significant correlation. Well, how about that significant linear fit? Right, that's really what the correlation is, significant linear fit. Otherwise, I'll put in a comma there. Otherwise, I won't do anything. I'll just leave a blank. Or, or, you know what, I can leave a blank or I can put in this. I can put in NS. NS typically stands for, in research methods, non-significant, right, very good, non-significant, okay? So, I have my if statement, and remember the generic formula there is, if some mathematical statement is true, we do thing one. If it's not true, we do thing two, okay? So, let's see if I've got my... Quotation marks and commas there. Sometimes I make a motor error. Okay, so I wound up with a non-significant R there. And now I will make this just a little bit bigger so people can see. Okay, so here's my critical R squared. It was that. I'm going to compare um, uh, the, the current value, A21. Oops, excuse me, let me, let me do that again. Um, greater than or equal to that, then we get significant, a linear fit, otherwise a non-significant fit. Okay? So that's the structure. I actually have to compare it to something differently. Okay? But that's the structure of the if statement. What I need to do, I'm going to copy that down one more, move that down just right down here. Why don't we get the actual R squared? Okay? So the actual R squared is going to be equal to Pearson. Who remembers doing a Pearson? Okay. And we'll take a Pearson on these values. That's the first column. That's the second column. Okay. And that's the Pearson that we have. Okay. That's the R value. I can square that and come up with an R squared value. Okay. So that's the observed R squared. This is the critical R squared. I should compare those two to each other in my if statement. That's what I meant to do. Okay. So if this guy right upstairs is greater than or equal to the critical value, which was 0.5625, then we're going to have a significant effect. And it'll be a long time. You have to hold it down for a long, long time. But every once in a while, you might see that my line 23 shoots over. <laughs> okay, And that, that shows you that I'm getting a significant effect, which should be 5% of the time. Okay. Now let me pause there. That was an if statement, and that was also an R squared. How many people have that? 
And people are not sure they've got that. It's okay if you're... Okay, thank you. Thank you, Victor. So uh, let's do a step-by-step, -step, uh, Victoria. If you can join me in cell... What's this? A22? Okay. Can we take a simple Pearson correlation on our data set? Our data set is ranging between A1 and B7. Simple Pearson, we've done that many times. And you, can, you might be able to see way up top there, equals Pearson. Okay. And that gives us our R value. If you prefer to use equals Corel, that would work just as well. I'll let you tell me, Victoria, when that works for you. So this equals Corel or Pearson. Either one of those is fine. And we'll highlight over this data set. Right. That gives us an R, and then we need to square that. Oh, I got lucky. <laughs> okay. So we'll square that, and we'll compare that number, that's our R squared for that data set, to this critical value of R. Okay. And I just got lucky when I hit the F9 key. I just happened to squeak it out. I'm ever so slightly higher than that value. So my if statement does, in fact, make that comparison. If this is greater or, or, and greater or equal to that, then we can say it's significant. Otherwise, it's non-significant. Okay. okay, one more time, show of hands. How many people now have that? Okay, so we have XL doing that check. And that was a check on the linear, the linear fit. Okay. Yesterday, we were uh, playing with nonlinear regression. And what we did was, we, after we had the linear one, we simply used control D and we made a duplicate. And then we took out the linear equation and we swapped in one of several nonlinear equations. We started out with the power equation. I'd like to uh, have a uh, little um, review of all these different nonlinear equations. So can we do this now? Can we take our power function, if you'll click on the power function with me, Okay, so we've got that highlighted. And we'll do a control D. Okay. And now we have two of these. I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it down this way. Okay. Now we have two that are really exactly the same to both power functions. How many people have that? That was control D, and that's a duplication is what we get. And as you hold down the F9 key, you can see that something moderately uninteresting happens, and that is that <clears throat> this is simply duplicating that. Okay. What I'd like to do now is can we take this bottom one that we had and why don't we throw that out and get a different nonlinear function. So we'll see all different kinds of nonlinearity. So I'm going to click on that line and get rid of it. And that gets rid of both the equation and the best fitting line. It also gets rid of the I square, R squared. Okay. And why don't we do it this way? Um, why don't we add a different function? How about something like maybe a, uh, let's do an exponential function. Okay. So I'm going to click on this, right? First we'll click on the chart. We'll see if I can get to trend lines, more options. Okay. And we get to this right-hand tab, as we typically do. And we can take any number of those. Why don't we go with the exponential function? Okay. So I can click on exponential. As always, I'll click on display the equation on the chart and also display the R squared so we get a coefficient of determination tells us how well the data are being fit by this nonlinear trend. And I can close that out. And I'm going to change this. We're used to say power function. It's now an exponential function. So what's cool about this, I think, is that for a given hit on the F9 key, we get a new set of random numbers, we get a linear fit, and we have so far two nonlinear fits. One is a power function, there is its best fit, there's its equation, here's the equation and best fit for an exponential function. Okay. And again, we can hold this down several times, and every once in a while you'll get a, here, here's a significant linear fit. Okay. Now that's kind of interesting. If we, if we look at that, the linear trend is accounting for 60% of the data. We're getting only 33% in uh, the power function, and we're getting 68% in this exponential function. Okay, So of these three, this one's making the best model. It's got the best model fit because it's explaining the greatest fraction of the variance. Who's following that logic? Does that work for us? We've got the highest R squared. Let me pause there and see if we have questions. Okay, So now we have a linear fit, and we have two nonlinear fits. Interestingly, if you take a look at the equations here, and also if you look at the equation sheet that I had put on your desk earlier, what I like about these particular nonlinearities is that each one also takes two parameters. That is to say, each one has some kind of an estimate of the slope, even the nonlinear slope, and also how high up or how far down we're positioning this best fitting line. That's its intercept. 
Okay, so these are all two parameter equations. So each one is as parsimonious as the next. Right? We're, we're estimating two parameters. Okay? And that's even true in the linear case. Okay, why don't we do one or two more of these? We've got a power function, we've got a logarithmic function. Can we now do a logarithmic function? So let's copy this one over by duplicating it. I'm going to click on this one. I'll click on Control D as in duplicate. Oops, excuse me. Okay, I'll move it over this way. I'm going to get rid of the current exponential function on that. When I get rid of that line, the r squared goes away, the best fitting equation goes away. And now we'll do this one more time. We'll go over to trend line. Under trend line, we'll add more options. And the one that we're missing for the moment is the logarithmic option. Okay? And as always, we want to display the logarithmic equation. And a version of that is also on your handout. And we'll display the r squared for that. Okay, and I think we can put that away. OK, so now we have four competing two-parameter models. One is a simple one from seventh grade, y equals m plus b. And then we have this other one over here. <clears throat> Turns out I wound up with a significant fit just by my, <clears throat> just by chance here. But my <clears throat> function, and this one is the logarithmic function, let's relabel that. Logarithmic function is accounting for, in my case, only 25% of the variation, whereas I'm getting 68% in the exponential function. Kind of cool when you think about how they're somewhat similarly shaped, but they're providing um, different kinds of fits, different qualities of fits. All right, how many people have that? Got a, a working logarithmic function. Okay, now let's see if we can do one more, um, but now we'll, we'll have a breach of Occam's razor. Occam's razor was what? Let's all yell it out. Ceteris paribus, all other things equal. The simplest explanation, explanation is the best. And simplicity here is indexed by how many parameters are you fitting? And we're fitting two parameters, a slope and a y-intercept, for each of these. Right? An m, if you will, and a v, if you will. We're going to go on to one more variety. We could do two more, but just in the interest of time, we'll do one more, where we can have now even more parameters estimated, and presumably we'll get even better fits. Okay? And what we'll do then is start to fit uh, a polynomial. So one last time, can we now click on the most recently developed graph, which is our logarithmic graph. We'll do a control D. We'll duplicate that. Okay, we'll get, we've got another copy of that one. I'll move it over to the right one more time. We'll get rid of the current logarithmic function by clicking on it and hitting delete. Okay. And then what we're going to do, um, I'll first name it is, we'll put in a polynomial, <laughs> okay? Who remembers hearing about polynomials <laughs> uh, from high school math, or maybe, maybe you were introduced to them in junior high school? Polynomials, okay? We're, we're going to fit uh, different kinds of polynomials. Now, just to think this through, we can ask, well, what kind of polynomial do you want? Polynomials come in so-called orders. Okay, and you can have a first order polynomial, second order, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. You can only, for a given data set, you can have a n minus one order polynomial. So if you have seven pairs of scores, you can go all the way up to a sixth order polynomial. Okay? If you had five pairs of scores, you could have, you'd go up to a fourth order polynomial. That's, that's as far as you can get. If you had 81 um, scores, you could go up to an 80th order polynomial. It's always n minus one. Okay? Let's do this one more time. We'll click on this. Okay, and we'll add one more function um, by going to here and trend line and data series. Okay, and you might notice that there is a polynomial option about halfway down. I'll let you click on that. I want to make sure people are with me. How many people have the polynomial option? And it typically defaults to a second order. That's that's basically the quadratic equation. And I think people were drawing that the other day in in draw to for one of our TED Ed questions. Okay. Now there's a little knob there, and you can bump up or bump down the polynomial for the data set of interest. So you can have more complex ones. You can go to a third order, fourth fifth or sixth. I'm going to go all the way up to a sixth order polynomial, which is as high as I can get. I think if you keep clicking on it after six, it just stops there. It doesn't go beyond six. And that's because we have seven pairs of scores. Does that work for us? Okay. 
So we're going to take a sixth order polynomial, a kind of nonlinear regression function. We're going to display the equation. We'll display the R value, and we'll say OK. All right. And here's the fit that I get. And as it's kind of fun to watch that thing bounce around as you hold down the F9 key. Okay, so now we have a linear equation and four nonlinearities. The first three of those nonlinearities are two parameter equations. Then we go all the way up to um, this equation. I'll let you look at your sixth order polynomial. First, let me check in. How many people have the sixth order polynomial? Okay. There's this crazy line that goes all over the place. It's a much more complicated looking line than the other ones, which tend to bend once-ish. Right? Okay. I wonder if you can tell me something else about the information that we have on the polynomial. We have an equation. Yeah. The R squared is always 1. The R squared is always 1. If you please poke on your F9 key and see that you're randomly generating numbers and see that this one always provides the best fit. Right? Because it's, not only does it always provide the best fit, it always provides a perfect fit. Okay? It's R squared equals 1. Okay? Does everybody have an intuition about that? Without getting into a lot of mathematics here, just intuitively, why would this thing always give us an R squared equals 1? And interestingly, the others don't, right? The others don't. You might get lucky and every once in a while get a significant linear or logarithmic fit. But this guy is, you know, it's actually a mathematical certitude that this one has to be at 1. Why is that? Okay, thanks. Good. R squared equals the like, proportion of scores that are like attributed, attributed to the line. Okay. And all the scores are always on the line. Right. Like, right. So we can we can form a perfect we, we can get a perfect one over the score. And that that's gonna be true. You might notice that no matter how you poke your F9 key, this score which will be randomly varying, will always land right on that. Okay? So, so that tells us all about r squared equals 1. So, and, and why is it the case, though, that no matter how we poke the F9 key, we always get every single score right on the line? That's a good intuition. Right? Every score right is on the line. Right? So why would that be the case? Let's go back to the degrees of freedom for a moment, if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't mind. So the degrees of freedom were defined as the number of observations minus... What was it we said a moment ago? Number of parameters. And how many parameters were we estimating in the linear case? Two, Two right? Okay. And that was y equals the mixed space. Basically, it's like saying this. I'm trying to come up with two guesses to fit a data set. I get one guess for the intercept. I get one guess for the slope. We can think of parameters in a way as guesses. Who's all right with that? Is that working for us? Okay. Let's take a look at this equation. How many parameters am I estimating? <laughs> okay. Actually, I think it's, I should see if I can pull that up. I think that's um, six, five, four. Actually, it's seven parameters. Okay. Right, because there, it goes up to a sixth order polynomial, plus you get the intercept. Right, so you go you, the sixth exponent, exponent, and then you get the intercept. Right, so you actually get seven guesses to fit seven data points. <laughs> okay? Right. Who's following that? So if you get seven guesses to fit seven data points, it's got to be perfect. Right? One other intuition about that. I'm thinking of a number in my head between 1 and 100. And I'm going to give Sarah one guess at that. Okay? So I've got my number in my head. Why don't you guess the number? Oh, it was 73. <laughs> okay, right? But she gets one guess and I had 100 possibilities. Okay? Suppose I gave Sarah two guesses. Okay? Right now, at one guess, she's, she's got a chance of 1 in 100 to get it. If I gave her two guesses, she'd have a chance of 2 in 100. If I gave her four guesses, she'd have 4 in 100. If I gave her 100 guesses, she, she'd get it right eventually. She could say, is it a 1? Is it a 2? Is it a 3? And sooner or later, she'd get to 73. Who's following that? Okay? That's basically what's going on with a nth minus one order polynomial, right? You give this thing all possible guesses, it can't go wrong, okay? But what you could do is say, well, that's, um, that, that's not all other things equal. Here I've got two parameters, here I've got two parameters, here I've got seven parameters, okay? So it's not all other things equal, but it does provide a better fit. Okay, questions about any of that? 
if you wanted to, uh, maybe you can go back onto this thing. You can back off the complexity of your polynomial. Right? You can back it off in such a way that it goes to a fifth order or a fourth order. Well, I, I think it will let us do that. It will join me back over here. We'll go back to the trend line. Go back to more options. We'll go back to the polynomial. Okay, I guess we can add a second one, second polynomial. Let's just say a, um, let's do a third order. And we'll add that equation. Okay, we'll take out this guy. And okay, now all of a sudden we've got a polynomial, but it doesn't go up quite so high. And our r squared isn't the one that it used to be. Right? It's something less than the one. Because okay, now, instead of getting 100 chances to guess uh, out of 100 possibilities, you're getting something like 4. Or 4 out of 7 rather than 7 out of 7. All right. Who's following all that? Okay. Any questions? Okay. Real good. So, that was a lot of formulation. What I'd like to do now is zoom in just a little bit and try to understand prediction. Why don't we start building? We'll get some practice this morning building on some of these equations. So let's put this one away and I have another one out that has a somewhat similar name. I'll join you out on the S drive into the practice sets and we have regression problems. <coughs> and there's one that says nonlinear regression equation demo. So we're going to work a little bit now with the equations. It's a different looking <coughs> different looking kind of spreadsheet. And what I think is important about this is now we're going to uh, dig in a little bit and take advantage of this. You will never have to memorize these formulas. I'm sure I haven't done it yet. Maybe some of you from other classes have memorized these formulas, but I've not, and I won't expect you to. So on next Thursday's quiz, if we're doing some nonlinear regression equations, uh, you'll be handed this, and you won't have to memorize it. You'll be able to use Excel. Okay? All right, what we want to do is answer some of these questions. Uh, we're, we're asked in this practice set, Okay, we're getting practice on all different kinds of nonlinear equations. We're asking this practice set to fit a particular kind of nonlinear function. We'll start out with a power function. Here's our data set. We've got these x scores. We've got these y scores. Okay? We're going to find, just like we did a moment ago, a, um, a scatter plot. And then we'll use a trend line to add the r squared and the power function, just like we did a moment ago. And then we'll also see if we can use the power function's regression equation to predict particular y scores. Okay, we'll develop the prediction equation. Okay? So let's start out by doing it this way. Okay? I'm going to highlight over all of that. And let me just check in again. Everybody is there? Yeah. Okay, we're going to highlight over all of that. And we're going to start building a power function. Okay? So we're going to go to insert. Uh, we'll start out by just getting a scatter plot. And we'll always take that simple scatter plot right there. Okay? I'll put this at the FG border. Okay. And show of hands how many people have, have that. Okay. And that's just the plot of the data. Right. And they're looking fairly orderly. Just to clean it up, because we're going to put on here a fairly busy R squared and a fairly busy formula that we're going to need to be able to read pretty clearly, I'm going to take away these vertical and horizontal lines. You wouldn't have to, but I think it just cleans things up a little bit. Okay. And just like we've done now several times, why don't we see if we can add a power function to this. Okay, and we'll get the best fitting equation and the best fitting uh, and the R squared associated with that. Here's a trend line, more options. Okay. And we want, in this case, the power function. Most of the way down, we'll display the R, actually the R squared, and we'll display the equation associated with that. Okay, so so far, not too different from what we were doing a moment ago. And I've got R squared. Now, I think these are not random numbers, so my R squared will be like yours, 0.9765. Who's got that? 0.9765, okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to see if we can begin to build up an equation, and we'll come up with predicted values in this column C. These were the observed values for X and Y. We're going to come up with predicted values, and ideally, these predicted values will fall right on that regression line. This will see um, how you can go from an X score to a Y score taking advantage of, of that equation. Some people are very, very familiar with this, some people less so. so. Let's take a look at this side of the page and you might find the power function about just a little bit above the midline on this. Again, you will not have to memorize these, I promise. 
Okay? But I would like you to be able to take this sheet and use it. Okay? You don't have to memorize it, but you've got to be able to use it. Okay? So let's see if we can understand some of the information on this page, and that I'm staying with the seventh grade terminology. Throughout this page, wherever you see an M, we have something that corresponds to the slope of the function. Wherever you see a B, you have something that corresponds to the intercept. Who's following that? Can that work for us? Okay. So now what we have to do is look at that equation and figure out which one is the M and which one is the B, and see if we can match it over here. So we're being prompted here in column D for the slope of this. Um, given what is in front of you, can somebody yell out the slope of this power function? Okay, I think I see 2.3459. I'm going to put that in. Oops, 59. How many people see where that number came from? And please uh, let me know if I lost anybody there. Okay, so that exponent number is actually controlling the slope of this function. Interestingly, in the power function case, that can be negatively or positively uh, balanced or signed, okay? And then our intercept, which I'll call B, if you will, if you'll let me call that B, and what's that in this particular equation? Let's yell it out. 8.9206, okay? So that's our slope and our intercept for this. It's not a linear equation, but it still has a, uh, a slope and an intercept, okay? Now what we're gonna try to do over here is we're going to develop a column in C of the predicted values given that slope and given that intercept. Okay? So we have to now somehow take advantage of those numbers and um, marry them, if you will, with, these, with this kind of a formula. Okay? So how do we get any kind of equation going inside of Excel? Equals. <laughs> okay, I'll give you that much. All right. So according to this, and we're looking at the power function, I need to take my B, and you need to multiply it, multiply it by a quantity, which is going to be the x value. Right? And I'm going to take that x value and raise that to the, the slope that we have here. So let's see if we can get that going. This is equal to my b. I'm going to click on the 8.926. Okay? And I'll come back and I'll freeze that in a moment. But for right now, I'm going to take that and multiply it by... And I'll put it in parentheses. Actually, I'm not sure you would need the parentheses because I think the order of operations would take over here. But just in case, we'll put a parenthesis there. And I want my x value, which is a 1 in this case. Okay. And what do I want to do with that? What do I do with my x value according to the formula? Raise it. Okay, how do I raise things? Let's all go like this. <laughs> okay, there we go. All right, we're going to exponentiate like that. And we raise it by how much? the m value. All right. So that might seem like a lot, okay? but basically we're, we're building up the prediction for that particular x given this best fitting line. Okay? That's the idea. Now I might have made a typo there. Let's see if I get some number. Okay? 8.9206. Uh, how many people can confirm that number? Okay, that should work. All right. I'm going to make an error. You tell me what error I'm going to make. I'll say, okay, I now have my equation. Let me copy it down. How did I do? Okay, I didn't do so well because I need to freeze, right? I need to freeze something here. And what I need to freeze are not the x values. We want those to change with every new row, but rather I want to freeze on that slope and that intercept. Okay, so that's going to be, I want to freeze the d quantity, column D, and also the e quantity, column E, which are the slopes and intercepts. Okay, so let me go back into my equation. I'll leave it pretty much as it is, but I need to freeze the d cell. I'll surround the d with dollar signs, and I also need to do that for the E cell. I'll surround that with dollar signs. How many people are following that logic? Okay, that's what we're wanting to freeze. We always want that, no matter how our X is varying. I'll hit it one more time, just to make sure I get back to where I was. Now let me try this again, see if I got it. Ah, okay. And I wind up with a lot of numbers that you can see appear to be increasing, maybe in a way that seems to match that dotted blue line. Notice that toward the end of our data series, the observed value way up top in that circle is 8,300. People okay with that? Whereas the predicted value, according to this best fitting power function, is 6869. Okay, so there's some mismatch between those two. All right. But it looks like um, our value is lining up with that prediction line as it should. Who's got that? Okay, one more time. Can we all click on this? And when you click on that, it highlights these two columns of interest because it's saying that we're creating a scatter plot of these x values for those empirically observed y values. 
Okay? If you'll join me by clicking on a little bit of a motor skill here, we're going to go way to the bottom of that rectangle and grab that knob way down here. Okay? And can you drag it over one more? Okay, so now we're going to plot two of these. Okay? We've got the blue data series, which is the actual data set. We've got the best fitting line according to that equation, which gives us an R squared of 97-ish percent of the variation explained. And then every one of these red dots is exactly on that prediction line. Okay? Does that work? Okay, so you can see that we probably have built this equation correctly. And now, if we wanted to make some predictions, maybe for some reason you have a child who's coming into your, your practice and you're trying to figure out where would you predict this child's uh, behavior to be, given that you have this kind of an equation that's relating this variable to that variable, and you want to make a prediction. Now you can take some novel score for the kid that you have in your practice. Maybe that, that kid has a score of 11.25 or 11.79, uh, and you could build, uh, put that in and you get a really precise prediction. And you might be wrong, but you would say that you have some indication of how far off you would be, because your R squared is telling you you're only going to be off by so much. You're accounting for about 97, 98% of the variation in these scores. Okay. So we could have done that with a y equals m x plus b. We had a slightly more complicated equation. Who's following that? Yeah? All right. How many people have done something like that before? Okay. Ho hopefully we learned something new about regression. That's when our main theme for this week is regression. And the twist is it's nonlinear regression. But hopefully you see some similarities with this. Every one of these still has a slope and an intercept. Okay? Okay. We're doing... All right on time. I wonder if we can we do one more and then I'll let you practice. There might be a question like this on next Thursday's quiz. I wonder if uh, we might practice. And as always, you can click on the neighboring tab, okay, and you can see that we've got a color coded answer key there in case you ever get stuck on how to build those equations. I frequently make errors when I'm building those equations. I have to have that formula right in front of me, and I'll get the order of operations wrong once or twice. But I do know something that if I get it right, every one of my predicted points should land right on the predicted line. Okay, okay why don't we do one more example? We'll go just a little bit further uh, into this, and then we'll let you practice uh, on your own time. But we want to make sure people are okay with all of this. Okay? So, here are the instructions. Construct a scatter plot of the data, and this time use the trend line to get a logarithmic function. So where do I begin to highlight to, to get the scatter plot going? X and Y. Vanessa's got it. Okay, so I'm going to highlight over X and Y. I'm going to go to Insert. I'll insert a scatter, and I'll take that upper left corner one. Okay, now we get a different looking function. I'm going to put it on the FG border. You wouldn't have to do that, but it spaces things out nicely. I'm going to get rid of these other lines so I can read more clearly the R squared and the equation that I'm going to need to read very clearly to many digits of precision in order to build an appropriate regression or prediction equation. Okay? All right, let's add our trend line. We're now getting to be pros at that. Here's the trend line. Here are the more options. Remember that this one is calling for a logarithmic function among our many nonlinear options. So I click on logarithmic. I'd also like to see how well we're doing on R squared and what the equation is. And I can slide that over. This one's doing fairly well. It's explaining almost 95% of the variation in the scores. Okay. And we, we also get a very different looking equation here. Okay. Still two parameters. So as parsimonious, Occam's razor hasn't changed here. Okay. Who's got that number? Okay. Did I lose anybody there? We've generated now the best fitting equation and the R squared associated with it. Okay. Now let's see if we can take advantage of this one. It's logarithmic. Okay, so we're going to use our cheat sheet. This will be handed to you. Okay. You don't have to memorize these. <clears throat> and we'll probably have to introduce something that will be new to some of you. First, can we all yell out, what will the n be in this particular case? Can we yell it out? 387, I think I hear people saying that. 387.88, that's our m. Okay. And our b? Can we yell it out? Okay, we really want to make sure about our B is that we have a negative there, okay, right? Because it is a minus 169.3. So I'm glad we did this one so we can... Uh, it would be easy just to just look at the numeric value. It actually is a negative. It wouldn't have to be a negative, but it is for this particular data set, okay? So we have our slope and our intercept, and those are the two parameters that we are estimating in this particular nonlinear function, okay? 
All right, so we're looking at this log function, and how do we get an equation going for our prediction? <laughs> Equals, all right. All right, we're going to do something here with our uh, uh, x value in just a moment. We're looking at the logarithmic function, and we have to start out with the slope. Okay, so why don't I click right on that? Okay. Then I multiply that by something. How many people don't know what that thing is? There's an ln. It's okay if you don't know what that thing is. Okay, your hands really high. How many people are less familiar with that? How many people think they know what that ln is? What is that ln? The natural log. What does that look like in Excel, the natural log? Typically, we're very familiar with common logs, which is a base 10 operation. Right? We can, uh, but there's also this natural log. Okay. How many people are familiar with the natural log? How many people are less familiar with the natural log? Okay. Melanie had some familiarity with it? Yeah, well, I took calculus. You took calculus, okay, right, yeah. Somebody said that if we ever run into intelligent life and they land here on this planet, they may or they may not know about pi, right, um, uh, 3.14, et cetera, right? They, they may or may not know about that, but they will certainly know about E, right, the natural log system, <laughs> okay? So it's one of these so-called transcendental numbers, right, that's really, really um, uh, interesting number for calculus, okay? And it's signified by the sine e, but inside of Excel, they call it the exponent, okay? So we're going to multiply this by, and there's a exponent command, which is exp, okay? So you hadn't done that before. You couldn't have known that, unless maybe you'd done some calculus, and maybe you've done Excel, um, used Excel for your calculus, okay? So where it says ln, that's where we're putting our exp left parenthesis. Who's following that conversion? Right? And if you wanted to jot on your sheets, that's fine. So uh, y is equal to our slope times the exponent, okay, the exp. And what do we, we raise the exponent to this x value. Okay. That's where that's coming from. Okay. And then we add finally our b, which in this particular case happened to have been a negative number. So I'm not going to hit enter just now. Hopefully people can see up there. I've got my d5 times some quantity. It's this mysterious number e that the aliens would know about, an important number in calculus. Uh, it's an exponent that we, um, uh, we, it's the natural logarithm that we exponentiate uh, to the tune of what's in a5, that's our x value, and then we add to that some kind of an intercept. Okay. How many people have that? Okay, let's see if I got that. Did anybody else get a 855? I did something wrong here. So what did I do wrong? How many people got an 855? 885. Yeah, what did you all get? Uh -huh. Okay, so where did I go wrong? What you can do is you can look at my genotype and look at your genotype and tell me where I went wrong. Do I have the right slope? Do I have the right intercept? Okay, so where did I go wrong? How did you do it? So people come up, so there's mine, my D5, exponent A5 plus E5. Okay, um, I think I can, but I don't know if that gets bigger. See, I think you need to see this thing, which actually doesn't get bigger. Yeah, let me go back to this. Okay, I have D5 times exponent A5, E5. Okay. Maybe we don't see what it is. Why don't you do it? If you have the correct number, why don't you drag it down? Okay, you've got the correct number, why don't you drag that on down? Okay. I'll drag mine down. Mine's going to be way off. Right. And then we also have to add these. Let you add your, freeze, your, your frozen parameters. Okay. And we'll see how many people get a good fit. Yours should look like this. Okay. How many people have something that looks like that? Yeah, okay, good. All right, all right. How many people wind up with a 929, 648 down here? Okay, and the point about that is if you look right over here, you'll have every point right on that line. Every dot is, is right on that line. Okay. All right, so 
so we have lots to practice. Right? We have uh, one that we can do for the exponential case. Okay, and here's that answer key. Here's third order. And um, I'm doing a third order polynomial. Notice that I have 17 scores here. What's the highest order polynomial I could do with 17 pairs of scores? 16, okay, right? So I've got a polynomial here that's doing fairly well. It's explaining 98% of the variation using <laughs> because it's a third order polynomial, okay? So I have the three different exponents and I also have some kind of an intercept. And that's giving me most of the way there. I could add an additional, you know, 13 parameters, but I'd only pick up something like 2% of the variation by adding those extra parameters. Who's following that? Does that work for us? Because if I added 13 more parameters, I could explain 100% of the variation. R squared would equal 1. But right now, even with these four, I'm explaining 98% of the variation. Okay. We're just about there. All right, so thanks for a good session. For tomorrow, we have a TED-Ed. We'll be talking about effect size. We'll be talking about power analysis. Um, we might spend just a little bit of time in SPSS tomorrow also doing, uh, plopping some of these in and having SPSS do some regression for us. Okay. Thanks for a great session. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.